If snow and ice are your thing, how about leaving the ski slopes behind and exploring deep inside an ice cap? On this week's travel show, we'll take you into the heart of an Icelandic glacier. on the program. We're on the trail of the tunneling machine creating a new but controversial tourist attraction close to the Arctic Circle. Our travel guru Simon Cald is here with his prescription for a perfect alpine adventure. We meet a hairstylist to the waxwork stars at Madame Tussauds in London and I head to Bhutan to touch down on what's billed as one of the world's most dangerous runways. And welcome to The Travel Show with me, Carmen Roberts. Now in just a few months, ski slopes across the Northern Hemisphere will be gearing up for another winter season. But if you're after an ice adventure with a difference, you might be interested in a new tunnel that's being dug deep into the heart of an Icelandic glacier. Not only is it an engineering feat, but it's also proving controversial, as Keith Wallace now reports from Longkjokul Glacier in the west of Iceland. The haunting Icelandic summer when it breaks through the mist, 24-hour daylight illuminates pristine landscapes. Typically, this is what people do on a glacier, and they're coming here in ever greater numbers. The biggest tour company operating here says it brought upwards of 35,000 people last year. For some, it's the first time they'd ever seen snow. In most cases, uh, man, many of the tourists haven't observed or seen a glacier with their bare eyes before, and they have not feel, felt it or touched the snow, or, or, or it's a uh, unique experience just uh, to stand on a glacier. Every year we see that the glacier is shrinking. It shrinks about 10 meters every year. Uh, that's uh, what we believe. So this is Longyearkel Glacier, a few hours drive northeast of the capital, Reykjavik. And it's fair to say it's in the autumn winter of its lifespan. Scientists reckon it's got about 150 years left before it disappears completely. Now, given that, you might think it wise, as far as tourism goes, to tread lightly. So drilling holes into a dying glacier might sound like environmental madness, but that's exactly what they're doing. This tunnel, due to open next May, will house an ice bar, exhibition spaces and a chapel. It'll extend two or three hundred metres into the ice, which the people in charge say will make it the longest man-made ice tunnel in Europe and, as far as they're aware, the world. But can you really drill that deeply and widely without damaging such a fragile environment? It's got at least one of the country's leading lights in this field scratching his head. I mean, the glacier will shrug us off. I mean, as will the earth itself at some point. So, I'm, and that's one of the key engineering challenges with the tunnel, of course. That's the way in which the glacier is trying to shrug them off. Um, but of course, the uh, controversy remains within getting people there. Um, getting people in there and to create this, it's all, well, it's all fossil fuel driven, of course, and it's all uh, driven by big heavy machinery, and it's, um, it's, it's the controversy of tourism in general. P people going to the Antarctic or the, or, the, uh, or the Arctic to experience a world, disappearing world, I mean, and then fueling that disappearance at the same time. Purpose-built eight-wheel ice buses will ferry tourists up the side of the glacier to the cave entrance. As the crow flies, it's a short distance, but ice holes and melt waters make progress slow. This is just a small service tunnel being built for the main event. Right now, it's cold, dark and rainy. The few workmen and machines here are in the process of being replaced by a much bigger operation, including heavy machinery and oil. There have been reports that the public health authority here has raised concerns, but organisers are adamant there's nothing to worry about. We are excavating or taking out 
uh, around five to seven thousand cubic meters of ice. The total uh, size of the glacier is 200 billion cubic meters. So this is only a fraction of the total size of the glacier and fully reversible because we would, we would take all our equipment out. This would disappear in 15 years. The whole idea is to provide tourists with information about glaciology and why ice sheets like Langjökull are receding, so the environmental impact has been thought through. Work on the main tunnel itself is just beginning now and it's due to open in May 2015. Keith Wallace reporting there from Iceland. Well, if you're after some more snow and ice adventures with the difference, here's some travel show tips. In China, the Harbin International Ice Festival has more spectacular ice than you can shake a ski pole at. The festival, which takes place in January and February, features a whole city of ice from the gigantic to the intricate. Best wrap up warm and leave those stilettos at home. Why not go beyond skiing and snowshoeing to check in for the night at an ice hotel? These magnificent structures are found in various places like Sweden and Canada, are often created entirely from ice and packed snow, and feature multiple art in the form of snow sculptures and ice carvings. They may be chilly, but what these hotels lack in warmth, they make up for in creative amenities, like ice-molded cocktail glasses and reindeer-fueled sled rides. And if all that carved ice makes you wonder how it's done, you can catch ice sculpting festivals around the world over the winter. In Canada, the Ice Magic Festival culminates in carving competitions for the experienced and the not so experienced. While in London, spectators can get close to some amazing creations at the Ice Sculpting Festival. And finally, if all that travelling gets a bit much, why not head to an ice bar? Loads of big cities like London and Barcelona have them. After a hectic day seeing the sights, it might be the perfect place to chill out. Time now for this week's travel update. First over to Spain, where at least one person has died after flash rains hit the islands of Tenerife and La Gomera. Heavy rainfall has caused rivers to burst their banks and widespread flooding around the Canary Islands. If you're heading there in the next few days, watch out for weather warnings and contact your airline to check your flight status. Over to London, where a fire broke out on one of Britain's most famous ships, the Cutty Sark. However, firefighters were able to contain the flames quickly, avoiding major damage, and the museum is open for business as usual. It's not the first time that the world's last surviving tea clipper faced fire. In 2007, a blaze caused $16 million worth of damages. In happier news, in sunny California, the record for the largest all-female skydive formation has been broken by 117 women. The multinational group also took the record for the largest ever sequential formation. Now that's what I call high-flying. If you visited Beijing recently, you may have caught this amazing scene at Beijing's Olympic Park. These surreal creatures, a giant spider and an automated horse dragon, were designed to celebrate the 50th anniversary of France and China working more closely with each other. The 17-metre-high horse dragon battled against the 20-metre spider in a performance based on an ancient Chinese myth. Over to Nepal, where officials are dealing with the aftermath of the country's worst ever trekking disaster, which took the lives of at least 41 people last week. The country plans to introduce tougher controls for trekkers. In the future, everyone heading up the mountains will need to register, and only properly trained and accredited guides will be able to lead treks. And in animal news, two three-week-old white lion cubs made their debut this week, melting the hearts of visitors at Belgrade Zoo, Serbia. The rare cubs were abandoned by their mother and are being raised by carers. 
Next up, ever wanted to walk the red carpet, strike a pose for the paparazzi, or step straight into the movies with some of the greatest icons of film history? Well, in this week's Citizens, we go behind the scenes at one of London's most popular tourist attractions to meet one of the hairstylists at Madame Tussauds. We're interactive attractions, so we encourage the customers to enjoy the figures. If people are um, putting their arms around them, enjoying them, then their hair will get messy. Obviously they can't do their own hair, so it's my job to do it and make sure it looks as it should. We come in at half seven every morning, a few hours before the attraction opens, to go around and check every figure, every single one. Bex is someone who's had um, various different hairdos over the years. Right now he's got this sort of like trendy East London hairdo, but um, in the past he's had kind of long hair highlights, all sorts of hairdos. <music> Boris Johnson's a really um, fun figure to do because actually rather than going around tidying um, his hair, making it look neat, he's actually one that we go around and actually mess up uh, to be realistic to him. <music> There's the wardrobe department, the hair department, um, colouring, because it's not actually makeup, it's oil paints. Before working here, I worked in a salon in Chelsea where they had some quite high profile clients, one of them being Kylie. And to then go into this job and then work on the wax figure of Kylie makes it even more interesting. Amy Winehouse is actually one of my favourite figures here to do. It's actually done in a similar way to Mary Antoinette. Um, so she has this big cage to give her the sort of like big ants bum sort of look. Um, and then she has the front bit inserted and a wig in there. So yeah, a lot goes into this one. She's had 23 figures in All the Queen with us. The last time we had a sitting with the actual Queen was eight years ago, so we have official hair dressing notes on how to set it. She has um, these very famous sort of horns at the side. Attention to detail is extremely important. The smallest bit of um, hair that you get a bit wrong can completely change the whole figure. It's the variety of hair you get to, to do here. Um, all the different eras um, and the different skills you have to use because although it's all human hair obviously there's different ways in doing it. This is such a kind of wacky way of, of doing hair and I love it. Still to come on The Travel Show. Our travel guru Simon Calder is here with tips on how to make a sparkling arrival in Australia. And I take to the skies in Bhutan as we meet the pilots who land commercial jets high in the Himalayas. So see you after the break. The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Welcome to the slice of the show that tries to make your travelling life easier. 
Let's start with Tara Pryor here in London, who tweeted at BBC Travel Show to ask... I want to travel around Germany, Austria and Switzerland with my 10-year-old next summer. Can you recommend a good route? Well, I've travelled with my children in those countries and I've learned what works for them. To minimise the distances covered, I'd urge you to stay south travelling by train or plane to the beautiful Swiss city of Basel where you can cross the Rhine on a boat using only the power of the current and enjoy some excellent hands-on museums. From here, Germany's Black Forest is just a short train ride away with the chance to stay in a hay hotel on straw mattresses in the barn. A spectacular railway ride leads from here to Lake Constance pausing, if you wish, at the source of one of Europe's great rivers, the Danube, for a real-life geography lesson. Friedrichshafen perches prettily on the lake and has the amazing Zeppelin Museum, celebrating a long-lost form of aviation. Ferries shuttle from here across to Switzerland, where you can get active in the mountains before taking a train through the middle of tiny Liechtenstein and into Austria, where you can round off the trip in style in beautiful Salzburg on the Sound of Music Tour, a bus excursion that anyone from 10 upwards will love. Next, Simon Charlton got in touch. My partner and I face being on our own at Christmas, so thinking, let's go away. We want sun on a budget, but we've already been to Spain. What do you suggest? Well, Simon, I was a Christmas baby, and I love getting away for the last week of December. The Portuguese island of Madeira is breezy but bright, though prices can be high. For the best combination of weather and value, I recommend Egypt, where you can be sure of a warm welcome, low prices and sunny skies, with the extra appeal of fascinating history. I'd go for Luxor on the Nile rather than Sharm El Sheikh on the Red Sea. You can choose between sunbathing all day or visiting some of the greatest sites in antiquity. Carol wants to know... What month is best to go to Mexico? I want nice weather and to avoid monsoons. Well, from experience, I rate December and January as the very best months. The storm season on both the Caribbean and Pacific coasts tends to run from June to November, and after this you can expect fresh, fine and dry weather. February and March are good, but by April the tropical sun is getting a shade intense. Finally, Les Nichols is heading for Australia this autumn and says, I'm travelling to Brisbane via Singapore to visit my son and his girlfriend. I'd like to take a couple of bottles of champagne to celebrate her birthday. Is this allowed? And if so, can you tell me the best way to do that? Australia has strict security rules on liquids on flights to the country as well as from it. The only duty-free drinks allowed are those delivered to the departure gate for a non-stop flight to Australia. You could organise this in Singapore, but since Australia is one of the few countries that has duty-free for arriving passengers, it's going to be much easier to browse on arrival at Brisbane. Fizz starts at around $14 a bottle, rising to more than $200 for the best French champagne. Well, that's all for now, but if you've got a travel question from security rules to luxury hotels, I'm here to help. Just email the travel show at bbc.com and I'll do my very best to find you an answer. From me, Simon Calder, the global guru, bye for now and see you next time. Simon Calder, our global guru, with some good advice as always. Now to a destination that very few travellers have been to, and that's the Himalayan Kingdom of Bhutan. But ask any seasoned pilot and they'll tell you that the descent into Paro Airport there is one of the most difficult and treacherous in the world. Situated over 2,500 metres above sea level and surrounded by steep cliffs as tall as 5,500 metres, I went behind the scenes in the cockpit for a white knuckle ride into what's been known as one of the world's most dangerous airports. It's an early morning flight from Singapore and many passengers are still in slumber mode. After a short stop in Dhaka, we're on our way to Paro in Bhutan. That's the highest point on Earth, Mount Everest. Paro is an airport situated around 2,400 meters above sea level. As we begin our approach, there is calm in the cockpit, despite the autopilot being switched off. We are flying quickly with our eyes and the local knowledge we have and this is how we fly right now. Uh, visual 
and no instruments, absolutely flying with eyes only. <laughs> so I'm getting closer and closer to the mountains. I disconnect the autopilot now. Now I have to hand fly into Paro. Okay, this is the button. Get that. This is the most uh, important equipment, very expensive equipment to avoid terrain and all. But unfortunately, in Tuparo, this is of no use. Through local knowledge, we know the airport is behind this mountain. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any instruments to guide you that the airport is behind. So you need at least someone who is experienced to guide you through. As you turn around, in a distance, you might be able to have a glimpse of the airport. So you've got to watch your wings, not too close to the mountains. So this is the only country who has a very unique runway and you can see that only after like five seconds or three seconds before landing. Blink and you'll miss it, apparently. We have uh, different landmarks to adjust ourselves or rate of descent to get uh, to the yeah, the exact point, certain height. There's the runway and I have to fly this way. So isn't that strange? Oh, wow, where's the runway? There, there. Can you see like a piece of road down there? Oh, really? That's the runway. Got to watch out for the electric poles. You've got to be very precise, and you've got to be very careful with this roof of the houses. Fifty, forty, thirty, twenty. Retard, 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 retard. The runway itself is less than two kilometres long. As passengers disembark, there's an air of relief, and rightly so. You've just landed at one of the world's most dangerous airports. It was actually really incredible, flying through the mountains and flying in side to side. So. You could see the green, you could see some of the houses, the temples. It was awesome. <laughs> the site is very beautiful uh, and uh, feel exciting, like in a movie. <laughs> Flights are only allowed during daylight hours to ensure the pilots have good visibility. Often planes are diverted because of rain and low cloud. It's so treacherous, only a handful of pilots are qualified to land here. As you can see, the scenery here is just stunning. And the view here from the control tower gives you an idea of the proximity of the mountains. And if you thought the landing was pretty exciting, I'm told the takeoff is just as thrilling. We have huge mountains blocking our departure path. So as soon as you get airborne, you have to either turn left or right and avoid the terrain. So we do not have space uh, to just uh, uh, fly straight in and out of Paro. So that's the huge, huge obstacle we have out of Paro. Terrain ahead, pull up. Terrain ahead. Well, that's it for this week's travel show. Coming up next week... Addy is in northern Portugal to find out why many of the buildings in Porto's beautiful old town are abandoned. You know, the funny thing is the rundown shabbiness adds to this city's charm. I mean, you could pretty much fall over and still take a good picture, but somehow I very much doubt the locals see it that way. That's next week and I hope you can join us for that if you can. And don't forget you can join us on the road in real time by signing up to our social media feeds. And if you're looking for some more travel inspiration, you can read our archives, which is found on our website and all those details are on your screen now. But until next time, from me, Carmen Roberts and the rest of the Travel Show team, it's goodbye.